So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome once again to the UOH History Webinar Series being organized by the Department of History at the Hyderabad Central uh, University. Uh, this is talk number 20 in the series. And uh, we are resuming the series after a short uh, interval for the winter break uh, with this talk by Professor Crispin Bates. Uh, and Professor Crispin Bates is known personally to many of us in the department, but I'm sure he is uh, familiar to most of us for the amazing scholarship that he has produced during the last three decades uh, or so. Uh, and I understand that the talk uh, that he's uh, going to make today on uh, you know, overseas labor migration from North India with special reference to its origin, intermediaries, and the role of trust uh, comes from one of his ongoing research projects on the origins of Indian uh, overseas labor migration during the colonial time. Uh, so before handing over the mic uh, to Professor Crispin, may I request my colleague, uh, Professor Anindita Mukhopadhyaya, to introduce and welcome the speaker. Over to you, Professor Anindita. Thank you, Varghese. Uh, it is my proud privilege to bring to our uh, department um, um, somebody like Professor Crispin Bates. Uh, we are all familiar with his work. Uh, now, most of us uh, are um, in awe of his um, uh, huge uh, production. Uh, and um, uh, it is, of course, uh, uh, well, since everybody knows Professor Crispin Bates, it's it seems, uh, uh, you know, uh, it seems a little um, odd to do this introduction, but it falls to me to do this introduction. So here I am. Um, Professor Crispin Bates is a research professor in South Asian and Indian Ocean Studies at the Sunway University. And uh, he is the professor of modern and contemporary South Asian history in the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he has uh, taken his PhD from Cambridge University, where he was also a research fellow at Churchill College. He has held professorships in Paris, Calcutta, uh, Kyoto, Tokyo, and Hitosubashi universities, uh, as well as National Museum of Ethnology in Japan. Years, he has had uh, many, many years of research in provincial and district archives in the Indian subcontinent, and all uh, around the Indian Ocean region. Um, he has authored and co-authored uh, 14 books and uh, 50 articles, uh, including a history of South Asia from 1600 to the present day, which is entitled Subalterns and Raj, uh, 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 which came out uh, in 2007 and it was uh, um, uh, you know, republished in 2010. It was, it was by Rutledge. Uh, he has been the principal investigator in a major UK arts and uh, humanities research council from 2006 to 2009, uh, which was a funded project concerning the Indian uprising of 1857. Uh, out of this particular research project, seven volumes have uh, uh, come out, um, uh, which are really, really interesting. So I'll be actually mentioning uh, uh, the books uh, uh, you know, on the uprising after I do the formal presentation, because I'm sure there will be many young scholars as well as scholars like me uh, who would be interested in uh, uh, looking at the uh, uh, titles of, of, his, uh, you know, of his research and to see the kind of areas which have been the subject matter of this huge project. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, there ha the, the series have been brought out by Sage, and there has been a, a you know a kind of rush of publication on this from 2013 to 2016. Uh, he is presently working on um, uh, 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 you know um, uh, Indian migrations uh, in the aftermath of the rebellion, uh, um, uh, and and uh, he is. Uh, uh, and, and more recently, he has been the lead investigator in a huge project grant, which, which is $1 million, uh, which has been funded by the UK Arts uh, and Humanities Research Council, 
on the origins of Indian labor migrations in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, um, and, and what is more to the purpose, and I think this is where uh, most of us would like to also see ourselves like uh, Professor Bates does, right? You know, uh, uh, and, and, and this projection of this future research is also fascinating because it is cosmopolitanism and decolonization and the history of Indian anthropology, uh, uh, which he just mentioned uh, at, the, at the commencement of this talk, uh, uh, the other within. Now, just to uh, uh, give an idea of the kind of work that is still possible on the Indian uprising of 1857, here goes. Um, uh, so um, uh, this is uh, Crispin Bates and uh, M. Carter edited, Mutiny at the Margins, News Perspectives on the Indian Uprising of 1857, Volume 7. Uh, it came out in 2017, Sage. Uh, uh, then uh, Crispin Bates and M. Mio edited, Sit uh, well, this is not really anyway, but it is um, uh, um, uh, something on South Asia, Citizen South Asia, London. Uh, 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 but but um, um, to, to get back to the mutiny, I'm sorry, I, I uh, sort of, uh, you know, missed that. Okay. Crispin Bates edited Mutiny at the Margins, New Perspectives on the Indian Uprising of 1857, Volume 6, Perception, Narrative and Invention. This came out in 2014. And then again, uh, Crispin Bates edited Mutiny at the Margins. Um, uh, okay, Muslims, Dalits, and Subaltern Narratives. This was in 2014. Then uh, again, uh, um, uh, uh, the fourth volume, Mutiny at the Margins, uh, Military mm -hmm. Aspects of the Indian Uprising. Uh, this was also 2013. And then um, uh, Crispin Bates and uh, M. Carter edited Mutiny at the Margins. This was volume three. Global perspectives. This is fascinating. I was wondering what. Uh, so obviously, we uh, I, I, we definitely need to catch up on you know different takes on on on, on the uprising, and uh, C. Bates and A. Major edited um, uh, mutiny at the margins, uh, uh, Britain and the Indian uprising, um, and uh, this was the second volume. And the first volume was. Uh, Again, a very fascinating way of looking at, uh, uh, you know, at, uh, uh, at uh, you know, an event which, which has been the subject of historical research for, for you know, uh, for, for uh, the last um, 100 years, if not more, right? Okay, so it is uh, um, um, anticipation and experience in the locality, Sage 2013. I mean, this was really, uh, uh, you know, an eye opener for me, and I'm sure it was an eye opener for many others here as well. Uh, with this uh, very small, very inadequate introduction, I uh, invite Professor uh, Crispin Bates to to uh, present his talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's uh, a very, a very long and very detailed um, introduction, far, far, far more detailed than was necessary. <laughs> but I'm, I'm hoping you'll all go and rush out and buy those books now. Um, that would be much appreciated. OK, so what I'm going to be talking about today <clears throat> is um, uh, 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 a development of from the um, from both the Mutiny at the Margin project and the Becoming Coolies project, because I'm going to be looking at, uh, well, part of my evidence is going to be data on Indian overseas migration immediately in the sort of decade and a half after the uprising of 1857. I mean, there's an, there's an old sort of um, truism that sort of the writing up of one project uh, goes on during the beginning of the next project. And at the same time as I'm now working on uh, uh, anthropology and the birth of the nation with uh, William Gould uh, the University of Leeds. Um, um, I'm also um, uh, writing up or finishing the writing up on the uh, Becoming uh, Coolies project um, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Okay now if I can share my screen. Um, uh, <clears throat> So the title of the paper is Indian Overseas Labour Migration 1857 to 1869. And um, as stated, this comes out of the um, um, Becoming Coolies project, um, uh, which had various um, uh, priorities. Um, 
The first priority of the project was to question uh, the place of indentured labor migration in the long history of Indian migration, uh, Indian migration and, uh, and diaspora, arguing that it, it was actually part of a long continuum of migration which went on before the 19th century and has continued right up until the present day. The second thing that the project aimed to do was to challenge the belief that migrants were entirely unskilled and ed uneducated and were mostly men. And we were also concerned to um, contradict the kind of dichotom typical dichotomous interpretations that migrants were all either kidnapped or simply profit maximizing individuals. But these two extremes obviously do not you know, encompass the wide range of reasons why people migrated and the way those reasons changed over time. Because one of the things that has to be remembered about uh, indentured migration is it went on for um, you know, nearly, a hundred, nearly a century um, and went to cover all parts of the world. So saying that they're simply all the results of kidnapping uh, or, or were all profit, profit maximizing individuals is obviously an unsustainable, unsustainable generalization. Um, so the, the broader argument we wanted to make was to show that South Asians have been global citizens uh, longer than we imagine, and that contemporary second wave South Asian overseas migration, as it is called, is not so different from those that went before. Uh, my, my often say about that is that, you know, uh, today's programmer is yesterday's sugarcane cutter. To ex uh, we were also keen in this project to explore examples of networks and agency within migrant communities, both before, during and after an indenture, and to show how networks, rather than the demands of employers, were central to the establishment of migration streams. Um, finally, we wanted to show uh, how the, to, to inquire into the role of affective or personal relationships and how these could enable subaltern migrants to evade the dominant structures of colonial regimes and even flourish within their interstices. Uh, the key element of this, our argument, therefore, was to show how within uh, these migration streams, men and women exercise diverse forms of agency, notwithstanding the diverse, arduous circumstances of their employment. Um, and out of that came a, a questioning of the notion of freedom uh, defined by the idea of the classical liberal Lockean atomistic sovereign individual subject who features so much in official historical and developmental discourse but we think, uh, or at least I would argue, is a, a chimera, a, a figment of, of, of the, the ideology of modernity, but something that is never actually anywhere to be found. Uh, okay, so we begin with um, the, the concept of indentured migration. Now, this is a very controversial topic in nationalist historiography because, um, the campaign against uh, indentured Indian indentured overseas migration was one of the very first uh, 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 issues taken up by Indian nationalists in the early Indian nationalists in the 1900s and, and achieved one of the very first uh, uh, wins over the colonial government in that it was eventually agreed by the Viceroy that it should, should end. Um, uh, although it practically did not end until 1925, I think it was the last, or 24, when the last ship of indentured migrants left India, but um, effectively it did end uh, with the outbreak of the First World War. Um, the indenture contract or girmit uh, or, uh, was a five year fixed term Greek contract, sometimes five, more often three, in fact, uh, uh, term. And it was considered to be um, uh, uh, unfair and unequal because it bound, during that time, uh, it bound a worker to work for one individual fixed employer, um, uh, which was obviously very different from the ways, the circumstances in which labor was employed uh, uh, in other circumstances in which they could leave at any time they wished. 
If indentured laborers wished to leave within that three year term, they could do so, but they had to buy their way out of this contract. Um, um, so it was a restriction on free movement of labor. Um, um, it was considered to be a valid idea, however, since at, the set, since at the time there were similar contracts in use in the Bengal army, which also restricted people to a period of employment. Uh, the laborers were known as Dumitias uh, or coolies if they were Indians or, or Sinkis or Sinkis if they were Chinese. They were introduced to supply labor to plantations and mines following the abolition of slavery in 1833. Um, but complaints led to the suspension of migration in 1838. It was only resumed under new legislation and close supervision in the 1840s. By the 1870s, indentured labor migration had been overtaken by other forms of migration. Um, but it nonetheless remains the focus of most historical literature because of its unusual nature, but most importantly, because it was overseen by the state, the colonial state. So there was a rich, rich archive of material relating to indentured archive migration uh, and very little to be found in colonial archives relating to other forms of migration. In fact, it is said that indentured laborers of the 19th century are the most carefully documented movement of a uh, group of workers anywhere in the world. So historians have therefore tended to focus heavily on this particular form of migration, which I think is, would argue is a mistake because uh, by the 19, uh, 40s, very many more Indians had, had, had migrated overseas without indentured contracts than had previously been migrating under the indentured scheme. And they do not tend to get written about very much. Um, okay, so these were the destinations where most of the migrants went. Uh, Fiji, uh, the Caribbean, South Africa, uh, Mauritius, East Africa, but also in very large numbers. The largest numbers of all went to uh, Burma, uh, Ceylon, and in, in Malaya. Um, and the, in, in both in Ceylon and in, uh, in Burma, uh, there was no indentured contracts used. Um, people were recruited by Kanganis, who were intermediaries, who Indian intermediaries who lent them the passage for their journey. They did not actually take out contracts with uh, the plantation owners at all. Um, and that was the case also for the majority of the workers who went to um, Leia by, uh, uh, it, by the end of the 19th century. Um, uh, indentured migration to Malaya was not, or Malaysia was not uh, in, uh, uh, finally terminated until 1907. But well before that, it was found that the recruitment of workers by um, Indians themselves by Indian contractors was a far, far more efficient system than recruiting Indians uh, through um, indentured contracts. Um, okay, so this is the type of work that they would be involved in um, when they first arrived in the 18, um, 1820s, 18, 1830s and 1840s, and that would be clearing the forest, clearing the forest in order to make way for uh, plantation cultivation. Um, soon after, in the first Indian settlers began to build basic settlements. This is a, a drawing from, uh, by a Frenchman from, the 18, from 1860. And then those settlements which were built out of, out of wood and, and uh, would then gradually be replaced by more solid um, uh, brick structures uh, by the end of the 19th century. This is uh, a street scene from Candy in Ceylon in uh, 1895. Now, um, as I've said, indentured migration accounted for a minority of the total number of overseas migrants in the colonial India, um, but it was very important precisely because it was these indentured migrants who, who first built the docks, who cleared the forest, who established the port cities, which from which enabled trade then to flourish subsequently all around the Indian Ocean. Um, um, the very earliest migrants were described by officials and planters as dangas, and they included coal, santals, orions, mundas, etc., from Chotanagpur. Um, but after 1857, there appears to have been a, a big change. 
here is a graph which uh, uh, taken from David Northbrook, Northrop, which shows that there was a big increase in overseas migration immediately after um, uh, the uprising of 1857. Um, and you can see from this graph, the largest number of people heading overseas uh, were, got, were coming from uh, Calcutta. And what um, uh, I did uh, with the help of uh, my colleagues, uh, researchers on the uh, Mutiny at the Margins project was to collect ships registers for all of, for, 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 for a sample of, uh, of ships leaving Calcutta port to um, uh, Trinidad, Guyana, South Africa, and Mauritius between 1857 and 1869. So a, the ships registers covered a total of uh, 4,600 uh, migrants. And we were able to trace uh, where they all came from. And as you can see, they were largely concentrated, uh, they, mostly in about, uh, they mostly came from about um, 10 uh, districts, uh, which were all of them in Eastern UP in Bihar, which were at the, uh, at the heart of uh, the uprising of 18. Uh, 57. They were, they were districts where most of the recruits for the Bengal army came from, and they were di districts which had a long history of, um, uh, of recruitment uh, to the Mughal armies before uh, the, the days of the East India Company. So this was a, uh, a, an area, the Eastern UP, um, where um, rainfall was uh, not always reliable or riverine tracks, which were flood prone, where agriculture was very fertile, but ag output was unpredictable. Um, so these, these were always areas in which there was a lot of out migration. So a lot of these people were inclined to migrate. But formerly, they had worked mostly in the service of the East India Company. And after 1857, we see a lot of these people enlisting to migrate overseas. Um, this map shows where those key migrating districts are, Ara, Chapra, uh, Patna, Lucknow. These are all places which were, as I said, the heart of the uprising and where a great um, many of the uh, soldiers in the Bengal army were recruited. Interestingly, if we then look, what we then did was look at the breakdown of this uh, population of migrants uh, by caste. Now, I, we grouped the caste together in a fairly arbitrary fashion because the point was to make comparisons. Um, so roughly what we did was we grouped together the Brahmin Kshatriya castes, the Vaishya and artisan castes, the middling peasant castes, Muslims, Dalit and backward castes, and Adivasis. And the fascinating thing is, if we look at us, uh, if we similarly uh, we used exactly the same categories and applied to them to the census of Bengal and the Northwestern provinces in 1881, we find that the migrants contained almost identical sections of each society, each, each part of society uh, uh, as, 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 as is found in the north of India. In, in, in a, a cross section of the migrants looked pretty much like a cross section of the North Indian society. So having mostly uh, according to some sources, relied upon uh, Dangars and migrants, migrants from, uh, uh, from the tribal areas of Chota Nagpur in the 1830s and 1840s and early 1850s. By 1857, or after 1857, there was a sudden switch. So we get uh, impoverished migrants from all sections of society lead, lead, uh, to choosing to migrate overseas, which I think is, I think it's a, it's a big change, um, but it explains a great many characteristics of the migration flows that, that uh, subsequently took hold, as um, I will go on to explain. Now, <clears throat> what you tend to see after 1857 is networks developing connecting particular communities in particular villages with particular destinations. Um, the migrants were recruited by, not directly by British officials or, or agents, but by Indian intermediaries. Indian returnee migrants were the most, recruited the largest number of these migrants. And what they tended to do was recruit from their own neighborhoods, their own uh, villages. Um, and this built particular connections 
um, between particular localities and particular in India, in North India and particular destinations overseas. Um, and these migrants maintained communication uh, with their uh, districts of origin or their villages of origin, not only through letters, but also through uh, people returning home after three years, often then to recruit others and re-engage and travel once again uh, to other colonies. Fascinating part of these networks play was, 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 in, in, was in providing information to migrants about where the best opportunities lay. And armed with this information, people would sometimes choose to re indenture in other colonies where they might be pay might be better uh, or where there were offers of free grants of land rather than return to India. <clears throat> Most old migrants became returnee recruiters and our sardars or overseers competed with each other for the best wages from plantation owners. So these networks that were established after 1857 are crucial in explaining the nature of migration flows. Um, now, who were these intermediaries exactly? Well, they are known variously as sirdars or sardars in North India, kanganis or maestries in South India, or mandor in Malay. <clears throat> And they were overseers and recruiters, foremen and labor representatives. Described as parasitic middlemen or traffickers, uh, uh, they are nonetheless, they exist in every economic system, I, I would argue, and are essential to the functioning of every economic system. Um, they were reviled by uh, sugar and rubber planters and were a common cause of complaint um, by British officials but I would argue there were also evidence of informal modes of social organization within uh, the economy of the migrants, which bound them together and provided vital services. Um, in Assam, the Akatis uh, received an especially bad press, press. They were discovered, described as the scum of the country, ex-conflicts, burglars, thieves, dacoits, and notorious budmashes. Um, Duffadars and other intermediaries were similarly described in similar terms. But at the same time, other sources described them as belonging to the very class of people who emigrate as laborers and live and move, and move among them. And I would argue the reality is, of course, is they could be both. They could be friends and neighbors, um, but they could also sometimes serve the interests of their employers more than their workers and uh, be uh, the source of enmity and criticism as well. Old emigrant sirdars uh, were, uh, were totally dominated recruitment in Mauritius. And this is actually my favorite quote is from the protector of immigrants in 1846, who wrote, no immigrant ever forms an engagement for himself or even communicates with the planter who is standing before him for the purpose of obtaining his services. They invariably and implicitly follow the will and directions of the Sirdar to whom they have given their confidence. And I think this is very important because this, you know, the ideal of, you know, of a, a free wage labor a capitalist economy is that the individual should sell their labor to the corporate, to corporations, uh, uh, or, or their employers directly as individuals. They should also relate to the state as individuals. There's supposed to be only one monopoly on power, and that is the state. Uh, and all other social economic transactions are supposed to be individual. And this, this, I think, is what is exemplified in this quote, is the idea that employer should stand before the employee in a face-to-face -face relationship. And anything that gets in between of that relationship, whether it be um, a, a, a sardar, a, a foreman, or a trade union representative, representative, is a corruption of the free market in labor, which was regarded as the ideal. <clears throat> the argument I would make is, is that this ideal was never achieved. There were always intermediaries involved in Indian overseas migration, as indeed in many other aspects of the Indian economy and economies in the developed countries of Western Europe as well. I think one of the great myths of, um, of economic theory is, is that we do somehow live in a, a perfectly economically competitive society in which the majority of transactions are conducted on the open market. The reality is, is the vast majority of transactions in any 
so-called market economy are still personal. Um, and that was certainly the case in migration overseas in the late in the, in the 19th century, despite the heavy handed intervention and control exercised by the government. So <clears throat> in order to <clears throat> carry on these you know, long distance relationships, um, these, these long distance networks tying localities together to the destination, clearly, um, I would argue trust must have been very important. Now, <clears throat> Trust is a, is a subject that which has been discussed quite extensively by um, um, development economists and sociologists. Um, in any risky transaction, the riskier the transaction, the more important it is that a relationship of trust should be established in order for that transaction to continue. It has been argued that trust relationships of kith and kin, and social, bi social binds between the, between the partners in the exchange are, were vital also to the Indian mercantile economy in the 19th century. Gilbert Unk, for example, has talked about, has written about the importance of trust to East African uh, Indians trading in the Arabian Sea and, and beyond. So this is something that has always been assumed and accepted as being important in the trade, in the world of trade. I would argue that it is also a vital part of the world of labor migration as too, but has largely been overlooked because of an excessive attention to colonial administration, colonial policies and colonial laws, which occupy the, the bulk of the space of the documentation within the colonial archives. These, <clears throat> these labor and trading relations relationships were maintained across time and space through extremely complex networks of kith and kin, of caste councils, of religious authorities, um, of, of relationships of friendship uh, amongst uh, fellow villagers, um, and all sorts of intermediaries who played a role in passing information backwards and forwards. <clears throat> the 1857 Royal Commission appointed to inquire into the treatment of immigrants in Mauritius concluded that notwithstanding the many objections that there are both theoretically and in practice to the Sirdar system, it is one so entirely consonant with the habits and customs of the natives of India that we fear there will be great difficulty breaking through it. So what they're trying to do is, is because that age old trick is if anything doesn't look quite right to them, they, they, they blame it on you know, Cor a tradi corrupt traditional Indian practices. Um, but in fact, um, the roles of intermediaries or sodars was essential to the system of overseas migration. And the British cotton planters, uh, sorry, sugar cane and rubber planters and copper and tea planters would not have been able to uh, survive without it. Um, this, the, the Sirdar recruiters were very similar in their methods uh, to the Kangani and Maestri uh, uh, recruiters who took laborers to um, um, uh, Malaysia and, and, and Sri Lanka. Uh, R.K. Jain, who's uh, uh, done one of the most uh, detailed studies of uh, uh, migration to um, Malaysia, wrote, each Kangani recruited a score or more of men belonging mainly to his own caste and king group. And from about the turn of the century, migration by families was the predominant form. Sometimes several emigrant brands, each under its own leader, combined under the overall direction of a high caste Kangani. This is just a picture of a group of, um, of, of migrants. Um, the, the borderline between a Kangani, a Sirdar, and a contractor was a very, very thin one. Um, often these terms are even used interchangeably. Um, um, one of the uh, most enterprising contractors that I discovered looking in the archives was one actually I uncovered in the um, um, Sri Lankan, the Colombo archives, the archives of the government of Sri Lanka. And he described a, a Patan contractor named Akbar Shah, who in the 1890s recruited 200 Afridis and Patans to undertake contract work, first in Punjab, then on the Assam Bengal Railway in Assam. He then moved with his workers to, uh, to Rangoon in Burma, 
where his men worked in quarries providing stone for the reconstruction of the docks. Within three years, he'd muscled out his two rivals and became the sole contractor with 700 to 800 Indian laborers in his play. His brother, Ajab Gul, then took a party of 200 Patans to Sri Lanka to undertake work on a railway state extension in Ratnapura. Um, this we all know uh, because um, in 1915, uh, Akbar Shah came to official notice, being suspected of having incited a Punjab regiment in Singapore to mutiny. In 1915, there were anti-Muslim riots in Sri Lanka. When Akbar Shah shipped to Colombo, he was suspected of conspiring to incite further disturbances. This is upon the evidence of a single intelligence officer. He was thus arrested and deported back to Yangon. Soon after, his brother was also arrested uh, and sent to India, where he was imprisoned by the Madras authorities, and the laborers were repatriated to the Northwest provinces, province in groups of 50 uh, via Mumbai. Um, so this was a, a story of uh, uh, a, a, a contractor who rose to great prominence. He was in fact described as the largest labor contractor in the Indian Ocean, um, which however, for political reasons came to a sad end. Um, it's only because he fell foul of the authorities for political reasons that we even get to hear about this, this contractor. There's many others like him, um, uh, I would argue, who are, who are moving parties of workers across the Indian Ocean uh, in, in every day, in, 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 in the hundreds of thousands, who we never get to hear about because they weren't part of the formal system of indentured labor migration. So within the indenture system, uh, the colonial authorities were extremely aware themselves of the importance of creating um, a, a notion of trust. Um, so, um, and they, they played upon the idea that they were working, that were amongst the workers, that they were employed by, indirectly by the Sarkar or the, 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 uh, the, the East India Company or the Indian government. And this was an important factor in placing, in, in encouraging trust in indentured migration uh, streams. Um, another method in, in, uh, adopted in order to enjoin trust was the issue of dual language permits, which outlined the items to be supplied to migrants. Um, for those who were literate or someone who knew someone who was literate, vernacular language contracts were also available. So people could know exactly what they were being paid to do and what they, and what, how they would remunerate, be, remunerate, be remunerated for the duration of their three-year contract. We have copies of contracts in which groups of workers have all appended their, their signature contracts, which then traveled with them overseas. Um, when workers went back to India in order to, to recruit others, uh, they were also carried with them certificates, um, which were evidence of the trust relationship between overseas re employers, recruits and returning recruiters. This one was written on behalf of the, com the, the, the company of uh, Chapman Barclay um, to the agents Colville Gilmore and Co in Calcutta. All Colville Gilmore and Co did as agents was simply to handle the financial transactions. The, the recruitment was, was actually done by the uh, ex-indentured migrants themselves. And this one says, dear sirs, the bearer of this Dibby Dean is a man of good character who returns to his native country with a sum of money. His intention being to come back to the Mauritius, we authorize you, should he apply to you for the cost of his passage, to pay the same at a rate ex not exceeding 30 company ru rupees, besides the cost of food, as well as to any able-bodied man who, wish to who may wish to accompany him, not exceeding 50 in number forwarding us their receipt in duplicate for the sum made. In other words, the letter says, this is a trustworthy man. You should pay him to send to come back to Mauritius and you should pay up to 50 people who, may, who he may bring with him, including uh, the cost of their food. So this, this, is, this is exactly the manner in which recruitment went on. <clears throat> the depot, of course, people were not, would, would, once they were recruited, they would take many weeks even months to traverse from the interior to the coast. Uh, 
And when they arrived, there wasn't always a ship ready to take them. So they might be left waiting for a long time um, at, the, um, uh, at the depot in Calcutta or Mumbai or Madras. And these were important sites where migrants congregated and information exchange. And Sirdars or gang leaders were sometimes uh, selected here uh, based upon obviously their charisma, the confidence that others might place in them and um, the promises that they made about the conditions of employment when that they would secure for them uh, when they arrived. These obviously were promises that would be made above and beyond the minimum that was within the contract, the indentured contract. But I would argue that alongside these formal, in, formal mechanisms of trust, um, that were encouraged by the British. There was also, there were a lot of other trust relationships um, going on, um, which were fun functions that were being performed uh, by the Sirdars. Um, uh, Sirdars, for example, were often retaining a portion of the monthly wages of laborers as a form of saving, which was then returned when a laborer wished to send money home uh, or he wished to send, um, he wished to return home to the subcontinent or in order to cover his living expenses if he became ill and his pay uh, was becoming docked. Um, the Sirdar would also lend money uh, for special purposes such as marriages. And one of the most interesting things that um, I discovered in um, records of uh, Mauritius is, is that these migrants, uh, these Sirdars would sometimes pool the lab wages from laborers, uh, thus rendering ineffective uh, punitive may, wage deductions are made by the planter. Now, in, in Mauritius, it was notorious that if a worker took, was ill, for example, and took a day off work without permission, uh, without seeking permission, he would be deducted two days of let wages for one day of absence. But by pooling the wages of all the laborers and then distributing them at the end of the month, um, the, the Sardar could actually render these type of punitive uh, deductions from uh, salaries ineffective. So this was one way in which they would uh, uh, help or work on behalf of their, their gang of workers against uh, the interest of the bosses. The financial arrangements between Sirdars and their labors strengthened their bond. And this was obviously uh, a source of tension between Sirdars and, and the planters. Um, uh, one of them complained that um, the competition now existing between the planter and the job contractor, who is generally some old Sirdar, who has acquired influence over his comrades and induced them on the expiration of their first engagement to place them under his orders, is now altogether in the favor of the latter, who is always able to offer higher wages, exemption from discipline, and continual leave of absence with the same guarantee to the laborer for the payment of his wages. So this is what's going on. After they've served out their first year of contract, they wouldn't go back to the India. Instead, they say, stay on, same gang, and they would renegotiate for better wages as, uh, as post-indentured free laborers. Um, and in this, uh, as, as um, uh, once planter commented in 1865, very often the demand for sugar was so high that very often the, the Sirdar could pretty much ask for whatever he wanted. Um, and he could uh, also control things like um, uh, exemption from discipline and leave of absence um, without any deduction. Uh, so why are intermediaries so notorious and also why are they ignored in much of the historiography? Well, there's many reasons. Um, first of all, intermediaries breach national boundaries and defy uh, territorial ideas of citizenship. Uh, today, they might even be described as traffickers because they do not actually obey the necessarily the bound, the, 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 the ethics and legal codes of any one country in particular. They serve only their workers and the, migrant, the, the plantation owner. And this is the second problem they have. They divided between two masters, their workers in their, who, who they've recruited and the employers. So they, they, their, their, their loyalty is always divided. And for this reason, they're always mis, mis, mistrusted. Um, they inhabit furthermore the world of informal economy. They're not recognized by the state. They have no official authorized position according to the state. Um, as a consequence, we only get to hear about them when things go wrong, when trust relationships break down and informal methods of arbitration and have failed. And I think this is the reason why we don't know about 
important role of intermediaries and why they have a bad reputation because the only time we do get to hear about them from colonial records is when something has gone wrong and they become the subject of legal case. Um, so the conclusion of this short presentation is that um, South Asia is not a static and conservative society. There's a long history of migration in North India and elsewhere. Despite the assertions of colonial officials, there was substantial evidence that high castes and skilled laborers were recruited for indentured migration overseas, and that many were probably former rebellious army sepoys. That workers commonly moved from one category of labor to another. For example, uh, the presence of ex sepoys in sugar colonies for, from Guyana to Fiji was later used by newspaper colonists to explain strikes and other militant actions by sugarcane workers. Above all, the most important conclusion that I want to draw is that pyramids of informal, affective networks of trust are crucial in all economic relationships and are often more harmonious and effective than official archives and, and historical literature might suggest. Intermediaries were crucial in providing information, mediation and establishing trust in contractual and informal relationships. And the neglect of the role of intermediaries in colonial, his, colonial Indian history suggests, I think, a need for, our, to for us to decolonize our historical and sociological imagination and to stop thinking about um, uh, in, industrial and migrant workers in the terms uh, that were defined for them um, by colonial administrators. Um, and I would finally say that just as for convict workers in Australia, the time has come for a more general reappraisal of the origins, role and identities of Indian, Chinese and other migrants in Asia. Um, and to end my talk, I just have a few pretty pictures to illustrate it. Um, a Sirdar's house uh, from uh, the early 20th century, the inside of a Sirdar's house in the Rose Bell camp. As you can see, he has uh, a number of brass instruments. Um, um, a Mauritius ship's register from 1858. Um, a Trinidad emigration certificate from 1861. These are the type of source materials that are used for this paper. Um, a Guyana emigration certificate of 1865. And obviously documents from the Bihar State Archives and the UP Archives and the National Archives of India. Um, these are letters that were found in Mauritius, an Urdu letter from Said Unisa Begum to her husband in Mauritius, which got retained in the post office because it couldn't be delivered. Um, um, this is a letter in Tamil uh, written by Narayanan in Mauritius in 1881. And this is a letter in Hindi written by Mansahai to his family in Mauritius in 1947. Again, the lost um, uh, letters um, office of the post office kept this and it was never um, destroyed. Um, Mauritius was also unique in that they um, uh, collected photographs from the 1880s onwards of all of the immigrants arriving. Uh, this is uh, one of Gurdin Chama from Gorakhpur in 1884. Uh, this is uh, Sajohi Dosad, an old immigrant widow, meaning uh, someone who migrated and then decided to stay on and not to return to India, uh, photographed in 1899. And this is a married couple, uh, Buljur, uh, Buljur Roy and his wife Reshmi. He went out in 1882 and then uh, obviously went back to India and recruit, brought his wife back to India with him. And um, so her, 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 her past is dated 1888. Um, and finally, I haven't said anything much about women. That's a, that can be a sort of gender issues. That can be a subject from an entirely separate uh, presentation. But I'd like to end with my favorite slide, which is the picture of uh, a wealthy coolie merchant's miss from Trinidad in 1905, which I always like to include because it sort of undermines this sort of uh, preconception that um, you know migrants did not always prosper because um, eventually those that stayed on, I would argue, did uh, becoming landowners, um, uh, um, uh, farmers, merchants, and traders, of which there are a great many examples um, that we can tell of. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Um,
Okay, please tell me you heard me. Yeah, yeah, we have uh, heard you loud and thank you so much. It is fascinating to hear that. You have questioned a lot of, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, you are audible. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. So uh, you have questioned a lot of entrenched ideas about uh, the migrations from uh, colonial India, particularly the so-called trans. Burgess, a little louder. <clears throat> particularly the trans-colonial uh, migrations from uh, North India. They particularly liked uh, you know, your ident identification of 1857 as a watershed moment uh, you know, in this flow towards uh, overseas. Also, you have argued that it was not just uh, people from the lower caste and with low character who migrated, but from all castes and backgrounds, people were migrating. Uh, also, you were highlighting the role of trust, both formal as well as informal uh, trust in making this uh, possible. So before uh, throwing it open uh, for uh, discussion, uh, I would like to ask you a couple of points. The first one being you, you have argued that you know, a, a kind of undue importance is given to endangered migration in our existing academic uh, literature, uh, even when large number of migrations were happening through other channels and perhaps in other forms, right? So my question is, uh, do we have some sort of number? Because when we speak about uh, migrations uh, during the colonial time, largely we rely upon guesstimates. Uh, so do we have some disaggregated numbers uh, to, to you know, say that you know, there were other forms of migrations and what are the kinds of different segments of migration? That's one. Second thing is obviously your argument about caste. You know? uh, People from all different castes were actually participating or taking part in this uh, movement. Uh, at a time when we keep on hearing that you no know, people belonging to lower castes and also having lower <laughs> character, you know, were migrating. So, do we have some specific data again regarding that, uh, you know, in terms of number? And the third uh, point is is fascinating the the way in which you have been, I mean speaking about intermediaries, uh, uh, particularly. Um, and obviously, as you rightly said, intermediaries are hated, and sometimes they are uh, you know, being seen as a real problem within the field. And uh, if you look at the institutional setup created by the, the, the colonial establishment in India, the particular target was uh, intermediaries. Uh, I'm just wondering what are the kinds of, you know, uh, documentation that was required for intermediaries during the colonial time, uh, just like documentations were necessary for, you know, the migrants, right? So I'll stop there and uh, maybe we'll wait for more questions. Well, um, I can answer. I can answer those because you've you've given what? How many? Five questions. That's quite a lot to begin with. Um, um, so as far as, um, if, if I could begin with the last question first, um, you said what sort of documentation was carried by the intermediaries? Well, um, I, can, uh, I can refer you back to my slide. Um, and I was saying very typically, uh, they would carry letters with them uh, when they travel back to India, uh, letters of introduction. Um, but there was no formal, there was no formal documentation. There was no British official, there was never a British record office you know, keeping details of intermediaries. Um, uh, they, they didn't have any official status. That's why I said they occupy the informal economy. Uh, they are what, they, it's, it's returnee recruiters who, uh, who, who, who recruited the migrants, but we only know from, um, uh, uh, but they, they, they were never, the, the, number of, the number of migrants was, was not who, who were brought by, um, 
uh, intermediaries was, uh, was inconsistently collected. Uh, there was no official policy to enumerate them. So that we know, we know for example, the protector in 1858 bothered to find out. And he found out that in, that in 810 old emigrants to Mauritius brought 14,722 new immigrants with them. Um, um, we know that in um, uh, 1860, 135 of them brought 1,811 immigrants. Um, but, but, but this was not statistics which were regularly connect, collected. Um, one of the interesting things that I didn't mention was this, that um, uh, the issue of remigration. Um, in 1865, as many as one in five of the migrants to Mauritius had previously worked elsewhere on an indentured contract, often uh, most commonly in Assam, and having worked there, decided that they'd rather not and departed from Mauritius instead because the pay and conditions were better. Um, but we, we have no, no uh, there, is, there is no uh, office of indentured of in, indentured intermediaries. We simply uh, know that um, uh, in uh, that they are uh, the sole recruiters in the case of migration uh, to uh, Malaysia. Um, the, for those who don't, you asked about how many people who migrated without an indentured contract. Um, the only way we can be sure about that is by looking at census returns. If we look at the census returns for uh, Burma, and uh, Malaysia and for Sri Lanka and for East Africa, we see a growing number of Indians there who are uh, recorded as being uh, laborers in many cases, um, running into the millions, um, all of them recruited by Kanganis. Um, but we don't have uh, any, any other information about exactly uh, where they were coming from and exactly who was recruiting them. Um, individual plantations would know that, you know, who, who, who were their laborers and, and who were the, the Kanganis who, who brought them. Um, um, uh, but there was um, uh, the, the most reliable source of information for, for migration would be immigration certificates. And in South Africa, in uh, Mauritius, in um, Guyana, in Trinidad, record, and in Fiji, all of these immigration certificates have survived. But in Malaysia and Myanmar, uh, they are, and, and Sri Lanka, they are not, they have either not survived or they are not available. I just recently heard that in fact, there is a large collection of immigration certificates in the Malaysian archives, which have not been yet catalogued. Um, and if this is the case, then this is, you know, a big revelation, because if we can raise the funds and get them catalogued, you know, we will, we will learn something um, uh, very, you know, important. We will be able to do an analysis of exactly where the migrants in, in Malaysia and uh, uh, came from. Uh, you asked about caste. And, um, I, and you asked if there were any actual numbers, and I've given you some actual numbers. Um, there was a similar study of numbers done uh, of, social, of the cast of migrants to uh, Fiji uh, done by Bridge v. Lau. And there's also been a study of the cast of migrants, mostly South Indians migrants, who went to um, South Africa. Um, um, which um, has been published as well. And um, uh, they come to broadly similar conclusions. After 1857, it's pretty much a cross section of society um, uh, that migrates. And I think, you know, this, this ties in with uh, a recent sort of uh, revelations about um, poverty in India, which argues that there is no such thing as a, a, an underclass of the poor in India. The main characteristic of, of rural life in India is insecurity. And at, at any time in their life, anybody or people, anybody might drop into the categories of the poor. And this was certainly the case in late, the late 19th century. Uh, there was profound insecurity for all sections of society in the colonial economy of um, uh, South of Tamil Nadu, uh, Bihar and UP. And so uh, the resort people from all sections of society, skilled, unskilled, literate and illiterate, 
would at different times um, um, embark upon uh, labor migration. Typically, it was seen as a form of security. If you could get at least one of your uh, children, your offspring, uh, recruited on a three-year contract or a five-year contract, you knew for certain they would save them, they would be, they would be paid, they would, they would uh, be fed, and they would save money, and they would send that money home. And that was a very important guarantee of the livelihood of the family at home when harvest uh, fluctuations um, might destroy their income from one year to the next. Um, um, so I, that's, I think, I don't know, can, were there any other questions that you no. asked me? Does that cover everything? I think you have covered everything. Yeah. So I'll uh, now ask if uh, anyone have questions uh, to ask. Uh, to what is there are questions in the chat box? Yeah. So, so Crispin, there are already questions in the chat box. You can read it for the uh, for uh, Doctor Professor if Crispin. If you can read yes. it directly. <laughs> yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the first one is from the Duke of Tripunitura, which is very interesting. Um, sir, the British Indian Army granted land rights to his veterans so as to resettle them after their service. Is Was this policy enacted in order to stem the outflow of ex soipoids outside into the sugar valleys that always be potential uh, troublemakers abroad? Um, well, uh, the general policy was is that the, 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 the attempt was made to only recruit experienced agricultural laborers for work overseas. So officially, um, uh, the migrants would not, you know, they would not tell of their uh, caste. Um, but, um, uh, was, sorry, they, 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 would, they would only be recruited if they were from agricultural caste. But of course, the reality is people would sometimes lie if they were from a, uh, a higher caste and not an agriculture, they would lie in order to get um, themselves um, uh, recruited. Um, um, this, um, in fact, means that the statistics that we have on caste distribution of the migrants probably underestimates the number of high caste amongst the migrants. Um, um, but um, uh, I don't think there is any, any attempt to... Uh, deliberately give land to ex-army recruits in India in order to prevent them from going overseas. I think the, 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 pun, the irrigated tracts of the Punjab that were granted to army veterans was simply a cheap way of giving them a pension uh, and also a lucrative method of developing land or bringing land under cultivation that could then later on be taxed and earn revenues for the states. So I think it was just a cunning economical measure in order to um, uh, provide um, a security of uh, li livelihood to, uh, to, to veterans. Um, is it possible to elaborate a bit more on the methodology of the project? Uh, this is Nandini. Well, um, the, uh, the research for this, for the Becoming Coolies was, project was done um, by my colleague um, uh, Ashutosh Kumar in North India. He produced this wonderful book, um, uh, Kulus of Empire. Um, there are two more. Uh, I, I, um, I did research in uh, Assam. Uh, sorry, so Ashutosh did work in South Africa and uh, Fiji and, and North India. Um, and I did a research in um, um, Assam, uh, Myanmar, Singapore, uh, South Africa, Mauritius and Malaysia. Um, and Marina Carter did work in Malaysia, in Mauritius and in London. And apart from Ashutosh's book, um, we're going to be, Marina Carter and I are going to be uh, co-authoring a book which is going to hopefully come out in 2022 um, called um, Rethinking Indian Labour Migration. Um, and there are also going to be two edited volumes coming out um, hopefully later this year uh, uh, relating to the project, one with um, uh, um, um, uh, which I'm co-editing with um, Ashutosh um, and another which is, uh, I, which is about the, the legacies of indentured labor called indenture and after. So um, 
there were a group, uh, there was uh, the project also involved um, Andrea Major, who did work in the London archives and also in mm -hmm. archives in Australia and Singapore. Um, and she was mainly concerned with the early uh, 19th century and the transition from slavery uh, to indenture. Um, so um, uh, another question we have is from uh, Mimansa Sharma. Since people from various castes and other backgrounds were migrating, how did that impact the social relations, social relations of migrants in the new places that they went? Well, this is a kind of another subject that you know, we're going to be tackling, which is um, the way in which the caste system generally tended to break down. I mean, it's a subject to another paper. Um, the, the religious uh, ideology of caste, the idea of purity and pollution very much evaporated because it was just not possible. It was, it was very difficult, you know, in the, in the ship, uh, taking people overseas and on the plantation where everyone worked together. Although, although they could be split up into work gangs, you know, which were from different localities and different regions, still they were, ha they were forced very often uh, to work uh, 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 shoulder to shoulder. Um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and sometimes it was not possible to maintain um, exogamous uh, marriage um, uh, relationships, sorry, so endogamous uh, uh, marriage relationships because there simply weren't enough of, 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 of a particular community for marriages to be carried on. So you tend to get um, a gr a different caste groups merging into newer caste groups. So all of the earliest migrants to Mauritius um, uh, became, whether regardless of their caste origins, became known as Babujis, simply because they often rose, rose up into clerical and administrative positions since they were the earliest migrants. Um, and they were often the first to acquire land and so they were often more prosperous too. So the Babuji is a kind of elite section of, uh, of Mauritian society today. Um, and other, other, other groups, for example, Tamil migrants, they were found it very, they, they very often gave up um, uh, caste categories that they, 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 uh, they were born into. So you won't find any, you will, you, in, 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 in many, in many uh, migrant destinations, you will, it was often difficult to find people who will be identified by others or who will self identify as Adivasis or Dalits. Uh, um, they often, um, the, um, tam all, all the Tamils tend to be just from a Tamil caste group in Mauritius. Um, all of the Telugu migrants form a Telugu caste group uh, within the Mauritius. And this, this type of agglomerating of, of, of often uh, creation of, of, of social groups which are largely ethnic rather than uh, caste based is most common amongst overseas uh, migrants. Um, um, and indeed escaping from caste and religious discrimination is one of the many, one of the most important reasons why people did emigrate in the first place. So this is another very, very good reason for people forgetting or abandoning their caste identity when they migrated. Um, um, yes, I agree about the documentation of migration to Malaysia. I mean, I'm hoping that I might be able to definitely locate these records and then get a government grant if I can to get them uh, catalogued and then made available to the public, I think, and obviously researched, which I think it could be a, a fascinating and very useful resource. Um, um, and final question is from Anindita. Um, if intermediaries are only the object of inquiry of relations when relationships of trust break down, how can the decolonizing agenda be addressed? Are there other ways of corroborating their roles in this informal economic domain? Well, uh, uh, the, the very often one has to read against the grain of the colonial records and, and to do so um, imaginatively. Um, uh, so, uh, and I often say that whenever, whenever you, whenever you can encounter stories of um, um, uh, ab so-called abuses or corruption in colonial records, this often means exactly the opposite. What it means, what it means is some Indian has found a way of making money uh, at the expense of a Britisher. So rather than being something that we should more to automatically condemn, uh, we should look clo more closely as what's going on. And uh, for example, there was a wonderful story I came across about, about um, um, uh, two Sirdars in, uh, um, uh, in the Clemenceau estate who were accused of um, 
misleading their employees, uh, their workers, uh, by, by telling them things like, you know, they've been commissioned, told to, to, to dig uh, 80 holes for the planting of, 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 of tree saplings. And they would say things like, well, actually, if you just dig, dig 60, no one's going to count and it'll be a lot less hard work. Uh, so they would, they would often mi misinform their, their workers about the targets that they've been set in order to make uh, their lives easier. Now, this might be from a one point of view, obviously an abrogation of their responsibilities and a very good reason for sacking them and for sending them back to India. But from another point of view, you might say, well, this is, this is, this is an example of two rather enterprising Sirdars who are doing a very good job of looking after their workers. These ones happen to get caught out. Um, um, but one has to, one, then, one can't know for certain, but one must speculate. There must be many other cases of people who were not caught, who did actually succeed in making uh, a tidy income from themselves. And that was certainly the case with all of the returnee recruiters from, um, uh, from Mauritius and from Assam, who, as I showed you in those pictures, could often find themselves living quite comfortable existences. All of these people were originally formerly former um, uh, migrant workers who've been uh, recruited on a three-year contract to labor in the fields, but soon managed to escape from that, that, uh, that, that state and to, um, to climb up the social hierarchy. Um, so uh, would you agree that the, um, uh, that the intermediaries were customized and commanded to perform in the way they did due to the immense pressure from above, states of state and employers, and were equally contractual and advanced debt payment obligations. The idea is not to establish a benign image of intermediaries or to deny the fact that intermediaries exploited laborers and when desired to improve their person. Well, I think, I think you're, well, obviously uh, everything you say is true and obviously it's also untrue because uh, just as many workers found, because workers very often did find ways to evade their contracts. One of the most common complaints, uh, both in um, uh, Mauritius and in South Africa and in Sri Lanka and in Malaysia and in Assam is birding, which is when uh, work employers uh, uh, bribe workers from another estate to abandon that estate and come on work on, on their estate. And some estimates put it as many as 20% of laborers in Assam had been um, um, bribed to relocate from one estate to another. So uh, there, although the contracts bound them to work on the particular uh, 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 state at one time, there was a lot of evasion of the law going on and a lot of it with the connivance of, of the planters themselves. Now, everybody was in some sort of contractual relationship, um, uh, the, but, uh, and that relationship, all, all capitalist employment contracts are exploitative by definition. You know, they are designed to create surplus value for the benefit of the employer. Um, but what is remarkable, I think, is how often these uh, th these regulations were evaded. And I'm just I just I'm not denying uh, the exploitative. I've said several times that you know that the the contractual relationships was unequal uh, and unfair. Um, but it should be remembered that this was pretty normative of of master servant regulations throughout the world in the 19th century. Um, those who had contracts. Uh, could complain. Uh, and if you look at court cases, there are a remarkable number of court cases involving complaints by workers, um, increased particularly from the 1890s onwards when the labor ordinances uh, were revised. And I think the idea that you know, the workers were always dumb, silent uh, victims who had no, uh, no conception of their rights had no idea or no, had no capacity to understand the contracts which they signed is I think frankly very patronizing and elitist and somewhat orientalist as well. Um, and we need to consider other possibilities, uh, uh, other ways of looking at, at laborers and, and allowing them a little bit more uh, agency than in the, the, the classical um, uh, 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 nationalist interpretation of uh, endangered labor migration. Uh, for many of them, it was a great escape. Um, not all, uh, by no means 
perhaps a majority, but for many it, it was. And most of them managed to transition eventually within two generations to a middle-class lifestyle that they could not possibly have aspired to at home. Um, did the migrants involved in similar work skill sets, e.g. in similar economics, or they had to reskill and upskill? I think there was a lot of uh, reskilling and upskilling. I mean, I mean <clears throat> if they could recruit uh, sugarcane workers to work in sugarcane plantations, they were very, very lucky. Um, in the in the early years of the Assam tea plantations, the, the first uh, uh, workers that were recruited were Chinese, often ex laskers or seamen who were recruited in um, in Calcutta, um, because the thinking went well. Uh, we're using you know we're planting imported Chinese tea, and uh, since it's Chinese tea, all Chinese people must know how to plant tea. So we'll include we'll recruit Chinamen in uh, Calcutta, and uh, we'll get them to to plant to. Uh, uh, to pl plant the crops in, in Assam for us. And of course, that was a complete failure. Uh, most of them had no intuitive knowledge how to cultivate tree, uh, tea. So um, the planters got became habituated to training the workers to the different tasks uh, that they wished them um, uh, to uh, assume. Um, and so, yes, definitely reskilling and, and upskilling uh, was, uh, was, was, very, um, uh, was very important. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so this, and, and I think that is one of the reasons why sometimes they became quite, not only were they very entrepreneurial individuals to, uh, in the first place, uh, when they chose to migrate overseas required a great deal of courage. But I think the experience of migration as well also gave these um, um, migrant workers a great many new skills, which then later, which subsequently would ena enable them to prosper in ways that would have been difficult at home. Do we, do we have uh, other questions? So we can't hear you. Uh, do we have oh, other you. questions? You were clinically sharp in time management, so we have a little more time. Well, I uh, did have I did have more points that I could have made, um, but yeah. um, I thought I just stick to the the main arguments. Um, I mean, this is going to be kind of one of the chapters in the. Um, in, in, in a book, the book that I'm co-authoring with Marina Carter, which is hopefully going to be completed next year. Um, okay, okay. May I ask one more uh, thing in that case? We have uh, a few more minutes. Um, since you were also offering a kind of uh, comparative optic between the first wave and the second you know, wave of uh, global migration from South Asia, uh, I would like to hear from you, how would you reflect upon the continuities and change in terms of the structures uh, and institutions of regulation, you know, uh, with uh, regard to... Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> well, one of the things we do know is, is that migration in the late 20th century is much more difficult than it was in the 19th century. Um, in, in, in a sense, all workers in the late 20th century are indentured in that it's impossible to get a work permit um, in the United States or the UK unless you have a contract for employment uh, from a particular, particular employer. And that employment has to be at a minimum salary to, for, you, for you to be able to uh, sustain yourself without, uh, without any, uh, any other support. So, um, and these contracts often are, you know, bound, do bind people for a certain amount of time. You can't just walk out of them. You may have to, sometimes you have to give a minimum of two or three months work notice before you can leave. Um, uh, and it'd be very difficult, you know, in, in, in a strange country for someone to arrive, say, yay, now I'm American, I'm free. I'm going to go and do whatever other job I might like without any kind of, contact without knowing the countryside, it's very, very difficult to, 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 to escape that initial employment. So most people, most Indians going abroad, do not 
enter into the free labor market. They go to work for a particular employer who has recruited their services, often, very often in the IT and software industry. And when their services are no longer required, their contract is terminated. And along with that, their visa, and they have to go home. A huge number of Indian um, workers in, um, in America have been forced to go back during the last few years because of uh, economic recession. Um, um, so, uh, uh, and in, in colonial times, uh, indentured migration was one very effective way to get overseas. In fact, it is, it, is, it, is, it is well known that after the abolition of indentured migration, um, indentured workers in Mauritius pleaded with the government, petitioned the government to resume indentured migration because they wanted their family members to join them. And it was very expensive to travel this long distance by steamship. Indentured contract was one of the easiest ways to get your contract, your relatives to travel out and to join you. Um, um, uh, but a great many people uh, traveled without indentured contracts to around the Indian Ocean. Um, and they could do in colonial times because there was no uh, there was no system of work visas. So anyone could get on a boat and go to India uh, or to um, uh, Mauritius and uh, set up sh and 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 become uh, uh, work as a clerk or a school teacher or become a merchant um, or or uh, or an agricultural laborer, whatever they would, or, or fishing, for example, was another big industry that employed, particularly harvesting, um, uh, sugar, uh, rice milling and fishing were the biggest employment industries in, in, in Myanmar. Um, and you didn't need a visa to do that. Um, uh, another thing that was different between um, the 19th century um, uh, colonial times and the present was that, um, Nowadays, of course, those who aid people in migrating are persecuted. They are called traffickers and they are, uh, are prosecuted. And because of the prosecution or persecution of traffickers, um, they never usually accompany uh, their, um, uh, um, their, the gangs of workers that they're responsible for to their destination. In colonial times, uh, workers, uh, a recruiter would recruit the workers in the village, take them to the depot, accompany them on the ship, then accompany them into the plantation, but then act as their overseer and work alongside the laborers in the plantation. So they knew well what their conditions were, what their problems were, and they could advocate on their behalf. Um, in the 20th, 21st century, moving from one country to another without a work visa is very difficult. And uh, those who attempt to traffic across uh, international boundaries are severely, vigorously persecuted, and they never accompany people throughout the length of their journey, which therefore becomes extremely hazardous. Um, um, I think the, uh, the worst ca mortality on the um, ships carrying indentured workers was uh, before the age of steam, steam in the age of sail. Um, ship journeys were much, much longer. Uh, problems of disease amongst the, amongst the ship's company were, were, were very, very common and nobody really had any idea how to treat um, a lot of these tropical diseases. Understanding of medical science had uh, had progressed, but I think I think you know migrating overseas nowadays for a great many workers is just like it was in the early days of of, of, of sale. Um, I've I've visited a great many plantations in Assam and in um, um, uh, South Africa and in Mauritius and in, well there are and in Mauritius and in Malaysia, and I'm astonished to find, for example, in the Malaysia. The majority of the workers, the Tamil workers, have now all left the plantations. They've gone on to other occupations. And the majority of the workers now are illegal workers who are hired and employed well below the official mm -hmm. um, uh, wage and have no rights whatsoever. Now, that really is taking us back to, you know, what overseas migration was like in the 1830s. Professor Crispin, I have a question. Yes. Um, you, you said that you have consulted the documents of the colonial period. Have you come across regarding uh, social and cultural aspects of these uh, uh, indentured lab communities in different parts of the world, like whether Fiji or Malaysia or others like South Africa? 
Oh, yes, indeed. I mean, the, what, the most interesting thing you come across is uh, permission to build uh, mosques, permission being sought to build temples. And one of the interesting things that in, uh, sardars do, and one of their roles, obviously, is if they have accumulated money, is to pay for the erection of, of temples. Um, and this is one way, another way in which they often um, cemented their sort of central role um, in uh, amongst the migrant community. It was not just by acting as overseers of labor, but also um, of, of paying for um, um, the erection of, 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 of temples. Um, so the, the, the re reproduction of, of, uh, of, of religious life within the diaspora is, is something that leading members of the community would, would, would play a role in. And those leading members of the communities were often, you know, the Sardars or ex the families of Sardars. There is one more question. Uh, yes. Question. Yeah. Once they decided to stay on, nation states emerged. Was the transition to the citizens of the respective place smooth? And the answer is that varied enormously from locality to locality. Probably the smoothest transition was in Mauritius, simply because in Mauritius, Indians were a majority. So they were able to form a majority government after independence. And uh, the country has been pretty much devoid of any kind of um, communal caste or ethnic or racial conflict. Um, I mean, uh, that some people might say that's an exaggeration, but I mean, compared with elsewhere, you compare, you look around, you know, uh, South, you know, the Indian Ocean, and you find other countries which have fared a lot less well. Of course, in South Africa, they had the apartheid regime in which Indians although they were given a status better than that of blacks, were still treated as second-class citizens. And they many complain that even today, uh, since the abolition of apartheid, although um, Indians in South Africa have uh, a lot of economic power, um, politically, they're completely marginalized. Um, in um, the Caribbean um, and in Guyana, um, uh, there often Indians, where Indians, for example, in Trinidad, did, found that, did not find themselves in a majority. They could find themselves in a tug of war uh, for political power between the uh, ex-slave uh, Afro-Caribbean um, um, community and the indentured migrant, um, uh, the indentured Indian ex-indentured Indian community. Um, so getting citizenship was not a problem for Indians in the Caribbean, um, but getting political representation on the very antiquated first past the post political system that they had been given by the British often proved a struggle. Um, I think not enough colonial territories were moved to proportional representation, which is the most effective way to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to ensure um, uh, that all minorities do get a voice. Probably the, um, in, in Malaysia, um, the situation is a bit, li bit like South Africa. Um, there's a, the population of Indians is about 11% of the community, um, uh, which means there are millions of them, um, but they, are, um, um, they do not have a significant role in government. Government is again, dominated by the majority community of Malays. But economically, um, um, Indians here are relatively successful. Um, probably the worst experience of migrants was that in uh, East Africa, of course, Indians, migrants to the East Africa, Indian middle-class merchants particularly were um, um, uh, um, um, persecuted in the, 1870s, in the 1970s, particularly in Uganda and uh, the reign of Idi Amin, the dictator Idi Amin, who expelled them from the country. And in, in, in Fiji, um, the Indian migrants were extremely successful. Fiji is a beautiful island, um, relatively disease-free, um, and, um, and 
and uh, disease free and Indians were extremely prosperous up until the 1980s when an elected Indian majority government was um, deposed um, by um, a military coup. And since then, um, uh, um, Indians in Fiji have found themselves marginalized. One of the big differences between different countries was, was dependent upon their right to buy land. In Mauritius, the Indians were allowed to buy land and very quickly became quite uh, became uh, dominant landowners from the 1870s onwards, particularly after a lot of the plantations during the Grand Mont-Selmont, as it was described, were broken up and sold off to um, uh, smallholding cultivators, um, sugarcane cultivators. In Fiji, um, uh, um, um, uh, Indians were, uh, were not allowed to, to buy the land. They were only allowed to lease the land. And that left them vulnerable to precisely what happened in the 1980s once they lost um, political um, support. Uh, those leases would often, would the, the original owners of the land would refuse to allow those leases to be renewed. So um, a problem of landlessness emerged amongst uh, migrant Indians in Fiji and a gradual out migration of Indians from Fiji had, to Australia and other flat countries has been going on now for the last um, uh, 40 years. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we have no more questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Christian Bates for that fascinating talk which uh, you know, in many ways enables us to problematize some of our commonsensical ideas about transcolonial migrations from uh, India. Uh, before signing off, may I ask my colleague, uh, Dr. Vijay Ramdas, to propose a vote of uh, thanks formally. Vijay, over oh. to you. Oh, thank you, Vagis. Thank you, Professor Crispin Bates. Uh, you know, your illustrative examples regarding the history of was labeled migration in the colonial era. Especially, I got fascinated with uh, the glossing out of the role of the intermediaries in your talk. Um, it opened up a you know, lot of, you know, broadening the horizon of this field concerning the uh, Indian war versus labor migration. Thank you, Professor Christine Bates, and thank you everyone for asking, you know, very, you know, very good questions and, uh, you know, uh, opening up, you know, fantastic debate and discussion in uh, today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Crispin. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Crispin. I shall write to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you all. Bye, Vijay. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.